Hi, I'm Peter Wang, and I'm the CEO of Anaconda. Today, I'll be talking about Python in the era of machine learning. Now, my talk is broken into several different sections. The first section, I'll be talking about uh, Anaconda's involvement and my involvement in Python for data science and, and what's good and what's bad and why I think uh, Python has come to dominate the landscape the way it has. Then I'll be talking about the uh, intersection of several different concerns, uh, open source software, um, the needs of data science, and uh, software communities in general. And then lastly, I'll talk about why I believe open source and open, openness matters so much in the era of machine learning. So Anaconda, as a company, um, has a, a, a very simple but a very big mission. Uh, we hope to empower people with data literacy. That's a very important word. Um, but we want to help everyone in the world ask better questions and make better sense of what's going on. We do that by providing software that helps data scientists be highly productive. We work on innovation projects as well as make you know, foundational things like the Anaconda distribution. Um, and we help businesses govern and manage their use of open source software. So that's also a really important need for commercial enterprises. Um, the thing that most of you are probably familiar with from Anaconda is what we call our individual edition. Um, sometimes it's called the Anaconda distribution. And what that is, is a packaging of many, many different libraries that are relatively popular for doing data analysis in Python, um, as well as a, an installer and package, man, package management tool that lets you get updates uh, of, of different new versions of packages. Um, an important thing about the Anaconda distribution or the individual edition is that it runs on many different operating systems and many different architectures. And on most of them, it does not require you to have uh, root privileges. You can just be a regular user. So if you're in a business computing environment, and you have a laptop where you don't have admin privileges, you can install Anaconda, and then you can be installing many things um, that are useful for your work without having to authenticate as a, as a root user, as a sysadmin. The Conda package manager that's included in Anaconda has a lot of powerful features. Um, one of them that's, uh, you know, that, that's pretty popular is the fact that we can isolate different versions of Python or R um, and many different versions of libraries within different directories. Um, this doesn't require using Docker. This can run on many different platforms. And so people would like to use Conda environments as a lightweight way to manage collections of uh, libraries they need in order to do their jobs or in, in order to work on particular projects. And again, this kind of um, sandboxing or virtual environment technology works really well uh, in, in the Anaconda and Conda package ecosystem because we build all of the C extension libraries and, and all these other kind of gnarly dependencies that are oftentimes um, important for high-performance data science computing. So with that, let's talk about the first topic, Python for data. When we first started the company about eight years ago, my co-founder and I um, had some general observations. Um, so my co-founder is Travis Oliphant, who is one of the creators of SciPy. He's also the um, creator of NumPy. And we've been doing work um, as consultants for a number of years. But around 2010, 2011 timeframe, we realized that there were two, there was a double disruption happening. And this, this uh, screenshot is actually of one of the slides that we used um, in our early slide decks back then. And we talked about this double disruption. One of them was big data um, and, and the idea that many companies would be producing and, and analyzing much larger data sets than could traditionally fit into a SQL database. The other idea was that cloud computing was really coming into its own. And um, especially with the ability to rent farms of GPUs and vector computing capability, um, this would unleash a tremendous amount of predictive analytics uh, and data modeling capability. So we thought that the com combination of these two things would um, put a lot of pressure on businesses to find people who could both understand the business problem and also could harness cutting edge tools and numerical software to go and do all sorts of wonderful things. And of course, we've seen that happen. At the time, we actually didn't think to call this particular emerging practice area data science. We called them domain experts. We had other terms for them. But this idea was that we would equip all of these um, 
domain experts or, or uh, subject matter experts with computational tools that uh, would take their analyses to the next level. We also recognized that Python was going to be a really, really important part of the story. I mean, we're big fans of Python, but we articulated a unique capability for Python, which is that you can use it in many different roles. So uh, in many businesses, you know, there's the software developers, uh, what we call programmers here, and they generally uh, have degrees in computer science. They get paid to write code. They're, they like to work in things like Java or C++ or JavaScript. Um, but they're familiar with Python, and Python is a, is a pretty standard tool in the traditional software developer side of things. Um, then you have business analysts, right? Business analysts in most businesses are using tools like Excel, or maybe they're doing dashboards and things like Tableau. Uh, and they're getting paid not for code, but for insight, so they can, um, traditionally, they're not writing Python, but if you were to show them a Python notebook, they can look at the code and kind of know what's going on, and they could probably learn Python relatively quickly. Um, and that's not true of like, let's say C++, right? You wouldn't take your average Tableau or Excel user and have a, any hope of getting them, <laughs> turning them into a C++ programmer um, in any kind of short amount of time. So in the middle, though, there was this emerging group Again, you know, this is an early slide, and we call them data developers or, or you know, domain experts. Um, now, of course, we just call these people data scientists. Um, but we felt that they would, um, they would be able to ask the right kinds of questions, but they really would like to use Python as an alternative, for instance, to MATLAB or to SAS. And so these people in the middle, they're getting paid not for insight alone, nor just for code, but for code that produces insight. And so that's a very important distinction. Uh, hopefully, many people here in the crowd uh, today uh, would recognize the, the, the importance of that distinction. So on the basis of these ideas, um, I started uh, well, what I guess, in essence, was a rebranding effort for the SciPy community, um, because I thought scientific Python, while it was an accurate term, it didn't have much business appeal. So um, we created a thing called PyData. I put together this little workshop in March of 2012. And some of the people pictured here are, have now become relatively famous, right, in, in the data science world with the creators of um, like Matplotlib and Pandas, um, uh, Jupyter, uh, and of course, you know, Travis, my co-founder, shows up in here. And um, this is just a little conference we held at the Google campus in March of 2012. Maybe 70 people attended it. Um, it was kind of a novel thing. Um, since then, of course, now things have taken a really wonderful and interesting turn. Um, and Jake Vanderplas actually has given a wonderful talk where he put the slide up at one of his talks. And he said, if you look at Python's evolution over the years, in the 1990s, um, that was really when Python could be viewed as a alternative scripting system to Bash or, or to Perl. Um, in the 2000s, the, uh, you know, Python on the uh, uh, on the scripting as well as the web development side was going through its own evolution. But in the, uh, in the numerical computing world, that was really the SciPy era. SciPy is a project started in 1999, and that really took Python in a new direction. Uh, NumPy came around in 2006 as a unification of two earlier um, uh, numerical matrix libraries. Um, and by the end of the 2000s, as we entered in 2010, um, that's right when Wes McKinney released the Pandas library. There were several other competing data frame libraries, and, and Wes's Pandas library um, uh, emerged as the clear leader. Uh, at the same time, the Jupyter Notebook uh, had come around, and then Anaconda was founded. So the 2010s really uh, have been the Pi Data era. And so... Um, yeah, it's taken some time, uh, but but we're now at the, I guess we're in the 2020s now, and you can look back at essentially 30 years of evolution of a language and then um, kind of a new community that came into the language and took it in a, in a really different direction. Um, and of course, in the 2020s, it's Python everywhere, right? You can use it for web development, you can use it for scripting, you can use it for embedded programming, and of course, you use it a whole lot for doing data science, data analysis, and uh, numerical modeling. But, um, but if we kind of go back a little bit and say, well, what caused data science to really emerge uh, in the beginning of the 2010s? It, it wasn't just Python. Uh, there was a lot of other factors, right? And I think it's important to understand why this happened, because I think it is a really important transition in the technology landscape that um, sometimes I, I think people who just come into it now don't realize that there was an explicit sort of set of evolutionary stages. 
So one of the things that happened was that businesses, as they entered into mobile computing, social media, all these kinds of things, they're getting way more data than their traditional data warehouse processes could possibly hope to handle. And they were also interested in using cloud to to look at larger amounts of data that was maybe messier, um, that was maybe more raw. So uh, they also saw that there were startups, you know, young, hip technology companies that were doing a very different data process. They were doing a very different analysis process. And they were able to make all sorts of real-time interesting predictions on customer behavior, on products, on all sorts of stuff by, um, by doing these alternative approaches that were not traditional SQL queries against a standard kind of Oracle database. So, um, so the industry, well, many different industries, but everyone could look to these Silicon Valley kind of uh, younger startups and see that they were doing something different and they were getting value out of those new processes. So there was, it wasn't just a pipe dream or some like, oh, maybe we should try this thing. It was, hey, these people are doing something very different and it's clearly valuable. So every industry had startups and leaders that were applying data science and machine learning techniques, usually using Python and R, um, against these large new big data kinds of uh, uh, data lakes or data warehouses they were putting together. Um, and of course, a really important thing is that most of these innovations were available in the open source, whether it was deploying open source Hadoop or whether it was using open source R and Python, you can go and as a business or as a small group within a business, you can just get this stuff, try it on your problem, and if it worked, great, right? That's actually very different than traditional business procurement and, and, and purchasing processes where people have to negotiate a long time, try to do a trial, do all these very expensive uh, time sort of uh, things. With open source, businesses could self-service those proofs of concept uh, around these open source tools. Really interesting. Um, so then... Uh, in the middle of this, why Python, right? Why not Ruby, let's say, or, or uh, you know, whatever else? I think Python succeeded for data science for a number of different reasons, but three key ones. The first one is that it's quite accessible. Many of the people who wanted to do this kind of data analysis, they're not expert software developers. If they have to go and manage a very complex software tool system in order to get something going, it would, it would slow them down. So they would just reach for the tools that were, were accessible to them, and Python was quite accessible. The language was easy to learn by example. It wasn't intimidating. Uh, one thing I like to say about C++ or C is that at any point in time, you're one semicolon away from a seg fault. Python, it's not that case. You can sort of try things. There's a friendly uh, REPL, a prompt. Especially if you use the notebook, you can get visual outputs very nicely. So that was a really, that accessibility is a really key, important aspect of Python. Another one is that Python, for all of the uh, hate that it gets on Hacker News, Python is actually very performant, especially when you're doing data science things. And especially, of course, if you use some of the tools that are available in the Anaconda distribution, you, you, you know, you're using these core numerical libraries uh, hopefully, you're not writing a lot of explicit for loops. But when you're using these core array libraries like pandas or NumPy, um, those routines are highly optimized. They're linking against optimized machine code. Um, sometimes, I think people who don't realize this, who come from a C or Java background, um, they may just think, oh, Python is a very slow scripted, interpreted scripting language, not realizing that for all of the really heavy lifting work that's like 99% of your CPU cycles, Python is running at optimized machine code level. So it's really hard to beat that. Um, and furthermore, there's many tools that have come out for doing optimization, parallelization, scale out, things like that. And at this point in time, uh, most modern hardware has really good ways to uh, bridge into Python. So a lot of those advanced new processors coming out, they have first-class Python support. The vendors, uh, the, the, the manufacturers of those hardware uh, pieces realize how important Python is. Lastly, Python is extremely compatible. So uh, it's been, I think in the, in the 1990s, we're, we're saying that Python is like the best glue language. It can talk to everything. Um, you know, it's not super opinionated about, you know, how it runs. Well, but here's one of the interesting things, actually, the virtual machine for Python, the C Python virtual machine is also very extensible. That's something that I think a lot of Pythonistas don't necessarily appreciate. The extensibility of the VM the fact that it can play well with C and C++ and Fortran and everything else has been the reason why things like NumPy and SciPy could exist, uh, why we can make LVL, LVM-based compilers like Numba 
talk to Python and do the right thing. So even though people like to complain about the gill, about how old the C Python VM is, there are a lot of advantages to its transparency and, and compatibility. And of course, lastly, Python runs on you know many, many different operating systems, many different kinds of hardware. It's a very compatible language. So um, back to that point about accessibility, the people who are data analysts, they are not necessarily interested in learning 50 different languages. They can learn Python and use it in several different contexts. That's really great for them. So that's all good. That's why Python for data science, I think, has become popular. That's why I think it has a long and bright future ahead of it. What are the problems then? Where are our challenges? My, my thinking around this is that, is, is that actually Python's challenges come from its success. So uh, we have this great open source ecosystem, millions of people making thousands of libraries. That's great. You can find a library for just about anything. But that creates this problem of like, which library should I use? I have a problem today. I was using this library and they updated it. And now it's out of step with this other library. What do I do? So we have this embarrassment of riches that there's actually too many people doing wonderful things in the ecosystem. Another challenge is that, well, you know, relative to the point made in earlier slides, Python is 30 years old now. And it was built in the PC era when you had one core, one CPU running on a very traditional kind of machine. Now people are building massively multi-core systems with terabytes of memory. People are running in large distributed clusters on the cloud. Um, so there's a lot of baggage in existing code bases and design decisions that are really hard to refactor. Um, at this point, it's very hard to change something about Python without probably breaking a thousand people's existing code. So that means that the room to maneuver is just much, much less. And again, that is the result of success, but it is still a problem. Um, and then lastly, uh, Python is a relative newcomer, even though it's 30 years old, it's a relative newcomer in the business world. And what I've observed is that um, every time open source intersects with business computing, both things are changed. They, 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 they emerge somewhat changed. So when Linux met business computing, it led to a commoditization of the server, uh, the, the server uh, operating system market. And what that did is it made it much cheaper for everyone to build software as a service things in the cloud. Right? It would be impossible to do cloud computing in the way we currently do it if, imagine, you had to pay $5,000 or $10,000 to license a copy of the operating system for every node you spin up. Right? Now, many of the younger people in the crowd don't remember those days, but that's what Linux unlocked. That open source innovation in Linux completely commoditized the, the server-side operating system market and led to a, a new set of capabilities. The same thing is going to happen, and is currently happening, as Python and R meet predictive analytics which used to require really expensive software. And when then you combine that with the availability of cloud computing, it leads to a completely new era of computing, quantitative business processes. Um, that'll be very exciting to see how that unfolds. Okay, so with that as the layup, let's talk about all of these things, open source, data science, and software communities. So when we talk about open source, uh, one of the things that I like to draw people's attention to is that the word open has many different meanings. Some people say, well, uh, open source means free, and it's free as in beer. So I get some free software, and that's great. Open source just means I get free stuff, right? Some other people might say, well, no, 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 hold on. Uh, openness and free means free like free speech, and open means I can go and look at the source code, right? So it's open for inspection. But how many of you actually gone and looked at the source code for like even 1% of the stuff you use, right? I just went and looked at the line count for SciPy and you're definitely not going to read whatever, you know, 80,000 lines of Fortran 77 code. Um, although some people point out a lot of that is auto-generated. But the point is that we use a lot of source that's open, but it doesn't matter if it's open because nobody looks at it, right? Um, so there's, there's questions there too about like, okay, is that really what people mean when they say open source? Um, another uh, another meaning of open could be it's open to to contributions, right? It's open to pull requests. If you see something, uh, if you do actually go and look at the source code, and you see something wrong, or you see a place to to make some improvements, um, you can go and submit a pull request and submit a patch. Um, so these projects, these code bases, are open to input. So maybe that's what open source is about. Of course, with input comes ideas, right? So is every project that's open to PRs and bug fixes, are they really open to new ideas? Or do the maintainers really want to run the project their way? 
how much is the project willing to change, right? So I just wanted to, to, to highlight that even in that word open, there are many different connotations. Open meaning open for me to grab it. Uh, open means open for, for me to inspect it. Open for me to give input. Uh, these are all different senses of the word open. But people generally don't get this detailed into it, right? They talk about open source and free software and all sort of means the same thing. And, and then you have, of course, articles like this that talk about, look, right now everyone relies on open source, but, but wow, it's really unsustainable, right? Open source developers are burning out. Um, you know, do we really, can we, can we keep doing this? And, uh, and, and I think an important question to ask in response to that question is, what are we trying to sustain? Are, you, are we talking about sustaining the maintenance of existing projects? Are we talking about sustaining the rate of innovation that led to the creation of those projects in the first place? You know, what is that we're actually talking about when we say sustaining? Because people will point out to, you know, many of these projects that have had, um, uh, it was a couple of years ago where there was this um, uh, period when like uh, a big cloud vendor, AWS, came in and started taking open source projects, open cores, and building AWS specific offerings on top of those. And, and these companies that were startups that had built a lot of open source and then they had an enterprise offering on top of it, they were, they were like, whoa, oh my God, you know, AWS just ate our lunch. Um, and this led to a discussion around sustainability of open source. My view on that is that these startups that did it that way, they don't really have an open source problem. They have a business model problem. But open source in general um, isn't necessarily in a bad shape or doesn't exactly have the same problems that these companies had because these startups, you know, they created these open source things so people would use their API, so people would adopt faster, right? It was a very calculated business decision. And then when Amazon swooped in and kind of tried to hijack those, or not hijack, but capture those users with those same APIs, um, it led to a business problem. But not this, it's not really the same thing as an open source sustainability problem. Um, another thing that uh, I want to point out about open source, um, and this is in conversation with someone who had been at Microsoft and made some points about um, how Microsoft viewed open source way back in the day, like in the 90s and 2000s. Um, and it got me thinking that actually, in my observation, there's there's two categories of open source that's worth talking about. Um, in the first category, and you can maybe recognize some of these logos, things like Emacs and Vim, Apache, Docker, Linux, these are open source tools that developers and sysadmins and people like that have written for themselves over the years. And I would say that it's a classical open source. It's what I grew up with in the 90s as open source software. These are made by developers, for developers in general. They're sometimes frameworks and libraries. And it's about developers scratching their own itch because, because they can, and it's fun. And it's a, you know, a weekend project that turns into you know, a multi-year uh, sort of thing that you have to go and, and take care of. However, in the scientific and numerical Python space, something a little different happened there, right? That was, that was still people scratching their own itch, but it was, if you look at who wrote some of these libraries, like SciPy, Scikit-Learn, Matplotlib, um, these are made by people who are not traditional software developers. They're made by uh, electrical engineers. They're made by, um, uh, by, by, by quants, you know, financial quants, or by um, applied physicists, even. Uh, it's a lot of people who... Uh, were not really traditional CS, you know, computer science majors. They, however, made these tools to scratch their own itch because the CS majors were too busy hacking on things like Linux and the Emacs and Apache. They were not, they didn't, they didn't know, know the math to build the things that needed to get built. And, and the reason I make this distinction, because you can say, well, in both cases, they're scratching their own itch. So what's the difference, right? I would say there's two different ways to look at what open source actually does. One of them is commoditization. In the case of uh, what I say, the classical open source, those are solving well-known problems, right? Uh, you know what a web server is. You know what a text editor is. And, and just because someone goes and builds a new cool text editor, uh, that's great. But, but we all kind of know what a text editor is supposed to do. However, the data and numerical and scientific open source community they had been pushing the boundaries and the frontier of what's possible. And so in this space, the open source effort has been really about rallying communities of people to go and tackle innovation work. That is something quite different. Um, and it's worth pointing out, it's a subtle distinction, but it's something that uh, you know many people who even are in the ecosystem 
don't think to articulate that they're doing something different than all the random people at OSCON or an open source conference who are just building their fun new whatever thing to show on Hacker News. These are these are people who are doing, you know, they're doing cancer modeling, they're doing um, simulation of like space weather, they're doing all these kinds of things, and they had to go and build Python libraries and tools because no one was going to do it for them. But in both cases, you know, there is something in common, which is that open source facilitates an open marketplace, a marketplace of ideas. In the one case, the cost of maintaining existing things can be traded off against the risk of, of, of destabilizing the code base and doing future innovation. And also, um, the network intelligence of many people can get together to explore a much bigger solution space, which is always more efficient. So in both cases, these are two different kinds of things. One is commoditization, one is solving known problems. The other is innovation. But in both cases, there is a marketplace dynamic around trading off innovation versus the cost of maintenance. It's a really beautiful and elegant thing to see happen. Now, that being said, why do businesses use open source? And when I was younger, I thought businesses used open source because it was cheaper, right? And even Microsoft was trying to make these arguments. No, the total cost of ownership of open source is very expensive. Um, that was back in the 90s. But what I've come to realize is that businesses adopt open source, not necessarily because it's cheaper, but because it gives them business freedom. They're not locked into a vendor. If some vendor comes along and says, oh, that's, um, you know, you can no longer use this piece of software. You have to upgrade. That's really bad for the business on the receiving end of that because maybe they're not ready to upgrade. Maybe that's not a project they want to take on. With open source, you can always just go and hire more devs to come in and maintain and fix the thing and keep it going until you're ready to go and innovate at your own pace. That freedom for a lot of companies is really critical. Um, also, the fact that you can go and do self-trials self-proof of concepts. You can just adopt, try it, and then know if it worked or not without a vendor constantly kind of getting in your face. That's also very, very uh, valuable for, for businesses. But um, that's what businesses value. What is the community value in it? Now, I told you about scratching your own itch. That's, of course, a valuable thing. But as I think about this more, I realize that you know the more mature open source communities, they have developed a culture of participation um, there's a certain pride in the craft. There's pride in the artistry of what they've built. Um, you don't go and wreck things and do things irresponsibly because, you know, there's um, there's a value to to the to the project, and it really is a gift economy. So people come in, they show up with participation, um, they give their attention and love into these projects, and I think of it as a community orchestra, right? Many people coming together to harmonize and make music together. It's a really wonderful thing. Um, and it underscored, it led me to understand that a really important point, that software is not just code. Now, for most of us, I think software and code are synonymous with each other. But I would argue that there's a bit of a distinction. So if you think about a software project, it's a process. Um, you know, it's, it's uh, a code is, is sort of a snapshot in time. So all of you have versions of Python on your laptops or your servers. You have a version of NumPy or Pandas. You know, that piece of code is that piece of code. You know, it does the same thing today as it did yesterday. But the software project, NumPy or Pandas or Scikit-Learn, it changes every day, every hour, every minute because people are submitting uh, bug reports. People are working on bug reports. People are having discussions about what the future of this feature should look like. So, so the way I would think about it is software is actually a river that's constantly flowing and finding new, you know, routes to, to innovate and new, new places to explore. And there's that saying, you can never set foot in the same river twice, right? That's the thing. These software projects, every single project you rely on is changing every single minute of the day. But of course, you don't take all those changes every minute. You take a snapshot of it. You take a cup and you scoop something out of that river and that's what you deploy, right? So the code that you're looking at is a frozen snapshot, but I would encourage people to think about software as, as a process. Metaphysically, software is not just a tarball of source code. It is a process. And it's a process that actually um, consists of a community of people kind of me meeting together. The maintainers, the users, all of these people are mixing together. It's a relationship and a process. Another important thing to realize about software, especially open source software, is that it's not property. And most people are familiar with the term intellectual property right? Here's a piece of music. Here's a movie. It's copyrighted. It's intellectual property. Well, closed source software is also treated this way, right? Here's a disc with some software on it. You paid for it. You get to run it. You can't give it to somebody else um, because, you know, it's intellectual property. But open source software is actually the opposite of property. It's unproperty. 
it's anti-rivalrous. Uh, and what I mean by that is that if I use a piece of open source software and you go and use the same piece of open source software, if I give you that copy, I've actually benefited from sharing because you're likely to find a bug or improvement. You're likely to use it and do something cool that I might want to do. When you take this and you raise it to the nth power of the network effect of millions of people using the same shared code base, you have incredible power that you don't get when you treat software, which is just ideas really, as a scarce, finite, rivalrous good. So I'd say that software is unproperty and and sharing increases value. The only thing that decreases value is forking and balkanization and cutting that network down into little zones of incompatibility. Um, the, the screenshot here I have is of the Wikipedia entry for um, a, a concept called usufruct. Um, and it's just one aspect of, of property law. And I encourage people to kind of look this up. Um, it refers to the right to benefit from the use of a thing. And that's different from the right to abuse or destroy a thing. So when you have intellectual property, the idea is that we can all get usufruct without destroying the thing. Um, and intellectual property is sort of a creation of the, you know, the, the, the media empires, the distribution channels and whatnot. But when, when it comes to open source software, you actually get more benefits from sharing. So when we approach it with this abundance mentality, when we see ourselves as part of a user community that can contribute more ideas back into that river, then we get a really wonderful thing that happens. Um, another dynamic I'm seeing, and the reason why this is this this uh, I'll bring it all together. But but one other thing to think about is that nowadays, you know, um, software, of course, having access to the free software is great, but um, as there's more and more software and there's more and more complexity in our computational environments, code is actually becoming a little bit less important. And what's becoming more important is APIs, right? So fewer and fewer projects are these big monoliths. Like here's all of the code for like this application. More and more now people are bolting frameworks together, bolting cloud services to other things and just kind of like trying to make things work. And this is good and bad. I mean, it's good because it's, you know, it can be faster to do that and to leverage other people's work that, you know, there's no reason to reinvent the wheel. It's bad because I think a lot of younger devs, this is all they know. From their perspective, doing software development means taking a bunch of duct tape and gluing things together until they kind of work. And so I would encourage people to think about when you're doing this, are you just becoming more um, trapped by APIs that sometimes are proprietary, um, and you are really more of an assembler of or an integrator of APIs, or are you building up something coherent, you know, in, in, with a coherent design towards a vision? This is a really important question because, you know, we do have of so much complexity now, um, especially in a cloud computing environment. So much of it is, is YAMLs here, and config files there, and scripts here, and scripts there, and scripts everywhere. Um, that people lose sight of the fact that, you know, there was a time when most of the time people sat down, they built systems and they thought about the whole system and they did coherent design. That wasn't a whole lot of like, you know, just scripting a bunch of systems together. So that, that, that API, especially in the era of cloud, the, the, the API uh, importance is, is a really, it's a relatively new thing. It used to be that APIs would be frameworks that you would vendor into your project. And now APIs are live external things that drive a rate of change into your project. And, and I think that one of the things that's a dark, I call it a darker pattern, which is that you'll have vendors, they could be startups, they could be cloud vendors, they might even have open source tools that serve these APIs. But these like open source things are really, I call them faux open source, because they're there to really attract people in, to suck people into using APIs and becoming dependent on proprietary platforms. So kind of you know, if you think back to the beginning of the section, I talk about openness and what does open really mean? Is it open for use? Is it open for inspection, open for innovation? These are all really important things to think about now because it's not enough just to say, oh, I use this open source tool from Cloud Vendor X, right? Because maybe what the Cloud Vendor X is doing is getting you to be, to be thinking about the problem in a way that just privileges their platform. And, and that's the thing that I definitely see happening. Um, the 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 positive view, not 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 positive, but the re the reason I, I stress this is because I think there's a really important flip side of this, which is that if we can create stable APIs that are open, they create a commons. They create something that's very efficient and valuable that allow many people to do innovation without 
forcing their users to choose narrow and narrower walled gardens. So um, this is something that the open source data science ecosystem has produced around Python, right? Many people now, when they create new tools, um, they build, uh, let's say they're building some new computational framework, they don't have to reinvent their own array library. They can just make it NumPy compatible. Um, they don't have to reinvent their own uh, data frame library. They can just make it pandas compatible, right? There's a lot of value in having these, these uh, libraries which you import, and you may think of them as, as helper libraries, they are actually standards of a sort. They're APIs that have become standards, de facto standards perhaps, but those things are actually great accelerators of innovation. And I fear that as we kind of backing up to the previous slide, as we just kind of um, blindly get sucked into becoming more and more dependent on proprietary uh, APIs, we're going to shrink the surface of that common, those, those, those commons that we're doing these innovation off of. So that's just something I want to bring up and, and sort of, you know, make sure people understand. So anyway, to recap all of this, um, and I don't talk fast and there's a lot of ground to cover, but uh, at the end of the day, you know, we talk a lot about open source software and openness and all these things. And, and it, I just want to make sure that everyone here has, you know, a, a different view on this now. Like uh, when we think about open, what does open really mean? From my perspective, uh, open means it, it's a value. It's a value about contribution, open for contribution, open for utilization, and user freedom. That's what open really should be about. Not just whether or not can I look at the source code. Is it uh, Apache or BSD license or something like that? Open is a value. It's a, it's a concept. Source actually is not that. It, it's actually less privileged of a concept at this point. It's kind of an outdated term because it refers to an era when reading the ability to read the code implied that you had a certain amount of sovereignty and freedom. And that's unfortunately no longer the case in the modern day, right? The, the source code has gotten too big and then too much of it ties to existing to, to proprietary services that just being able to look at a piece of open source software, it doesn't guarantee you anything really. Um, and then even the concept of software itself, we should stop thinking about that as snapshots, as, as code drops and tarballs of source code. We should think about software as dynamic processes. And, um, and it's a, it's a process that flows through a human ecology. Who has the input about what problems the software should solve? Who has the bandwidth to go and do those things? You know, and, and the confluence of these things actually is a very dynamic thing. And the difference about the open source software community is that um, they're focused really only on one thing, which is to develop that software well. They're really not being driven by external business requirements. Oh, we have to, you know, put this feature in so we can sell this many units by this quarter. So we all get bonus at the end of the year, the open source software community, that is a, a social environment in which people can live their values and chief among them is that they want to ship good software. So my, my thesis is that good software requires healthy communities. You can build healthy proprietary community, uh, healthy communities around proprietary software. That's entirely possible. But I think the world is changing now to where people really understand that, um, open source communities build good open source software. And that kind of, that's, that's the order of, that's the sequence of events, essentially. So again, just to get people to think about open source software and open source software communities in a different, maybe a different view than, than they've had before. So my last section is, um, it's something that's a little bit, you know, it's not so much about Python, but it, it is sort of about Python. And it's my views on why openness really matters in this era, uh, in the coming era of machine learning. Um, and this is a bit of a personal journey for me. So uh, in 2016, I really started looking into the question of how do we build good, resilient, uh, a good, resilient technological society? Um, this question, of course, uh, any of you who are familiar with American politics, 2016 is when uh, we elected Donald Trump as president. Um, but even in the run-up to that election, I could see that the way technology was affecting society was not healthy. Um, and it really actually didn't even have much to do with Trump. It had to do with things even prior to his election. But certainly, the, the way that some of the social media companies behaved and the way that people uh, fell apart. Uh, relative to that election, got me thinking, and my background, by the way, is not computer science, it's actually physics. And 
uh, as a physicist, I like to try to understand the deep root of problems. I like to try to get the foundational parts of problems. So I started thinking more and more. I read a bunch of books. I you know, have even more books that I haven't finished reading yet. Whole stack of stuff I was trying to understand. Everything ranging from human psychology to history um, and, and all these different kinds of things. And I realized um, there's some really, really fantastic work that's been done by um, by smart computer scientists, you know, and philosophers. Uh, and I'm just going to highlight a couple of things here. Number one, a really interesting book by Norbert Wiener, who's a very famous American computer scientist. And he, um, in the World War II timeframe, he was working on building anti-aircraft kind of tracking devices and, and the, uh, you know, gun tracking devices. And, um, and he had this, uh, he had this um, very big warning that he put out there in this book, which is that we cannot, there's a lot of danger when we trust decision-making to things that cannot think abstractly because they cannot identify with human values. And this is a book that was written like in the 50s or something. I mean, he was written, it was written a long time ago. Um, and so uh, this is, of course, I mean, I think everyone here can recognize that this is a, a very prescient thing to have said about society, you know, before even the digital computer came around. Um, and then another one is um, from uh, a French philosopher in the mid uh, 1900s. Um, named Jacques Ellul, and he wrote a book called The Technological Society. It didn't start getting translated in English until the late um, 1900s. And, and, and so I, uh, I think some of his work is just starting to really filter into the mainstream in America. But he had, he had just a very deep critique that I'm not going to get into too much detail here. But, um, but, but it strikes the heart of this concept of a technological society. Okay, And this is actually very important because here – in the Python ecosystem, we're using Python and we're using data science and machine learning tools to build an even more technological society. And, and Jacques Ellul's um, critique was that when we build tools that optimize technique, they create this artificial system that steps away from the natural world. And, um, and that the applied sciences are, you know, Basically, it privileges the applied sciences, but only the applied sciences that um, optimize for efficiency. And it doesn't matter if you're a capitalist or a socialist or a communist, but in any of these systems, they're about optimizing efficiency and they elevate the sciences, they elevate the automations, they elevate the techniques that push for those narrow optimizations. And uh, his is just like very harrowing statement for me that modern technology has become a total phenomenon for civilization. Uh, it's a new social order in which efficiency is no longer just an option, but it's a necessity imposed on all human activity. Very, like a very big statement. But if you look around at the world around us, it's, it's, it's hard to say that that hasn't happened. Right. Um, and then Another thing that's important to keep in mind, so I'm just giving you some vignettes of some, some of these ideas that I've picked up as, as I went through this personal journey over the last four years. Um, it's, a, it's a commentary by a friend of mine, uh, Tristan Harris, who is at the Center for Humane Technology. And he gives this great talk. He has a TED talk that's wonderful. Um, and he says that, you know, when it comes to AI, everyone is super worried about the singularity. Everyone's super worried about what happens if AI gets smarter than people and they start taking all our jobs and they start killing all of us. Um, and, and his comment was, well, you know, well before the time when AI overtakes human strength, we should worry about when AI overtakes human weakness, right? Um, and you look at that and you're like, oh, yeah. I mean, the first time you see, he presented this to me, I saw it, I was like, of course, yes, right? Um, and it's, it's, it's just such an amazing thing to point out, such a simple thing, but it's, it's scary because we know, I mean, many of you probably here at the conference, you're working on systems that outpace and outrun and outsmart the average person on the street. And uh, if you look at what's gone wrong with social media, with the attention economy, with computational propaganda, you know, all of those things are way more powerful than the average person's weakness. So uh, another thing that Tristan talks about that's just brilliant is uh, the, the, you know, uh, every time you scroll through like Facebook or every time you're looking at YouTube recommended um, videos and whatnot, behind that is essentially the supercomputer 
that defeated the world grand champion in chess and in Go. And what it's doing, it's playing a game against you for the control of your attention. So are you better at managing your attention than the world grandmaster is at playing chess or Go? And if you're not, then you're definitely outclassed, right? So this is a, such a stark statement that um, it, it's, again, just one of those things I want to, be able to think, get people thinking about because the society that we have, um, and, and I know I'm speaking to uh, PyCon Taiwan, and American society is different than Taiwanese society, but ultimately all of us in the developed world, in, the, in modernity now, we live in a world that has towering stacks of complex software and algorithms in everything, right? And I think when we build these great, when we build these towering stacks of complexity, we also create a technological gradient that leads to a cast, what I call a caste system. There are people who are plugged in, working hard, making money, doing high tech, and there's everyone else who don't understand how any of it works. And, and I think that what we're going to do with machine learning and automated inference systems as we apply them to every corner of, of um, the industries in, the, in all the economies, I think these systems will grow to consume all of the surplus, all of the excess possible productivity will be driven by the kinds of systems that you and I will go and build. And so ultimately what we're seeing is we're going to have algorithmic reinforcement of existing structures of power, of, of, of wealth, and of regulatory capture. That's what I see. And, and maybe, you're, maybe I'm being too much of a pessimist. Maybe reform is, is possible. I mean, I come from a country where Donald Trump is president. So maybe I have a colored view on some of these things. But um, uh, it, it's not so much that Donald Trump is president. It's that he managed to become president. The system that we have uh, in the, you know, the wealthiest country in the world, that system, that structure, and the automation of it, I don't see that automation by itself is going to fix that system. I see it just perpetuating the problems that are already there. And there's a wonderful write-up, wonderful essay by um, Scott Alexander, uh, who runs this blog called uh, Slate Star Codex. And he wrote this uh, piece called Meditations on Moloch. And uh, without getting, again, too much into the philosophy and the details, um, he talks about just the, 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 the feeling that many of you may have had at some point, uh, if you reflect on things philosophically, you know, why does the world work the way it works? You know, no one wakes up in the morning saying, you know what, I want a terrible world where, where, where brothers are fighting us brothers, where there's children starving on the street, where the super wealthy are just polluting the world and cutting down the Amazon forests. We want to create that world. No one wakes up in the morning saying they want to build that world. And yet, that is the world we've ended up creating. So what does that? Why does that happen? Um, and the brilliance of the poem, Allen Ginsberg's poem, is that he gives, an, an, he gives the, the, the anti-answer. He says, oh, well, it's this evil thing called Moloch that does it, all right? And, um, and so the reason why this is such an interesting poem is that we all know there's not an evil Dr. Evil sitting in a lair trying to make everything terrible right? The, the giving that as an answer highlights the absurdity of such an answer. So it highlights the fact that the system that creates bad outcomes is not itself an agent. You can't just go, and in America, and I don't know how it is in Taiwan, but in America, we have a lot of people who believe in total conspiracy theories who are like, it's these two evil, super rich billionaires that are messing everything up. If we just get rid of them, everything will be better. Right, and they've got everyone else kind of under control, and the whole system is corrupt. But it's really just the, a couple of these billionaires, or like you know, Bill Gates is trying to poison everyone with a with a coronavirus vaccine, and like you know, these kinds of these people don't understand how to look at a system and say, ah, oh, none of the nodes in the system are trying to be evil, but the whole system is really really broken. Right, the ability to look at the system and critique the system outside of just a single agent is an incredibly uh, it requires a lot of abstract thinking skills. And unfortunately, the average population does not really like to think in that way. So then you might say, okay, Peter, that's all fantastic. But what does this have to do with Python? And the, what it has to do with Python, and I promise you I'm almost done, but I believe Python is a very unique technology. It is actually empowering for regular people. The fact that regular people who are not software developers can look at a notebook, look at a Python script, try to do something with it, 
you know, my son is 10 years old and he can do a little bit of Python. Um, the fact that it's so approachable for the average person is extremely rare in technology. Um, and, and so we have this precious thing that has come out um, that we can go and give to everyone to go and use to do data analysis, to go and ask questions and poke around and to understand the world around them. This is now accessible technology. And the thing I want to point out is that computer languages, um, they're not just software. They're actually thoughtware. There's a famous computer scientist, the, the inventor of APL, uh, his name is Ken Iverson, and he wrote this book that um, notation is a tool of thought. So when we use computer languages, we actually shape how we think. We, sh we think differently. Python is an accessible tool that can help the entire world think differently. It's much more accessible to most people than a lot of the existing software development languages that are made by coders for coders. Um, and that ties to Anaconda's mission about data literacy. And, uh, you know, literacy is a very powerful, many of you may know who this is. Um, literacy is a prerequisite for freedom. And I think in a data, uh, in a data driven world, data literacy is then a prerequisite for freedom. So if we have open data science tools, then we can defend data privacy. We can be open to many kinds of innovation. We're not trapped. We're not gated by just a few particular vendors um, or by the government. We can empower people to, to, to avoid becoming what I call informational vassals, where they have to believe just a model that's given to them or a conclusion that's given to them. They can actually go and ask questions and they can go poke holes in it and, 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 and make improvements on it. So right now, at this period in time, machine learning is, you know, we're obviously a lot of people are doing machine learning, but I think it's actually just the precursor. What comes next is when we take our predictive models and we loop them into um, actuators and things that can affect changes in the real world, and then immediately run that back through the same system. And that's what I call a theory of action, right? When we complete that cycle, then what we'll have is full-on cybernetic systems. And the age of cybernetics is coming, right? The machine learning era is just a precursor to that. And when the cybernetic era gets here, then we have really got to be ready to make sure that humans are at the center of it and that all those technologies we build are in service of human values and human goals. Um, and I think openness and literacy are such critical pieces to make sure that's the future we get. Otherwise, the power to control, to, to, to crush down, um, and to just perpetuate the broken systems of, of power uh, that we have today, um, that will just be almost insurmountable. And so every single one of you that is teaching Python, that's improving it, that's using these tools, you're all actually doing a very, very important thing. You're promoting data literacy, which will help us safeguard freedom in a much deeper sense in the, in the time to come. So... With that, I thank you very much for, go, for, for bearing with me in all my slides, um, and I'm uh, happy to take some questions. Hello, Peter. Can you Hi. Hear us? Yes, I can. Yeah. Okay. And thanks for your wonderful sharing. And now we are going to have. Eh? But can you open your, your video? Um, I thought I did. I'm in the uh, PyCon Taiwan 2020 room one. Is that not the right uh, session to be in? Yes, we can see you now. And okay, yeah, good. Yeah. And okay, we we are going to our QA section and do you know we have a slido? Can you see our slide? Oh yeah, hold on. Let me let me pull that up here. Um and maybe you can choose some question and also we will open to our attendees to um, have some questions. 
Okay, so there are four popular questions. I'll start from the first one. Uh, can you give an example for the open source darker pattern in the machine learning or data science space? Um, yes, I can. So you'll see many of the cloud vendors, and there's also newer startups that have um, like predictive APIs. Um, they will have libraries that only th that are open source, but only they develop. And those libraries are particularly tuned and designed to work with those cloud services or those prediction APIs. Um, I don't want to really name names here because um, I don't want to get called out on Twitter and <laughs> start a war with anyone. But I think anytime you go and you look at um, uh, people who pretend to be open source, but it's really just their project and they're not really accepting community input and really the project is there just to make money for the business, then that's what I would call the darker pattern because it violates that value of open participation and creating open standards, right? Um, I know that er or in the early days, for instance, um, I will call someone out by name. So TensorFlow early on, they got a lot of um, criticism from the community because they were very insular. They only sort of did things the TensorFlow way and they were not very open to contribution. Um, they've since, you know, made some improvements in that direction. But but even in the case of TensorFlow, right, they have some of their own array libraries. They have a lot of their own primitives, and they want to get people to use those instead of contributing maybe changes back into NumPy and working with the, uh, the, the SciPy and NumPy community to improve some of the community things. Now, TensorFlow is made by Google, which is a business, which has business goals, and, and I understand all that. But that's maybe not a darker pattern. Maybe it's a light, light gray pattern. But those are examples. Shall I move to the next question? Okay, we will open the question for our attendees. Do you, okay. Is anyone have questions? Please feel free to ask. Okay. Okay, and. I think there are more questions on style. You can answer the question on the following. Okay, so on um, on Slido here, um, what kind of target user Anaconda differentiates from the uh, other Python distributions like Nthought Canopy? Um, so I, I think uh, the best way to answer that is that with Anaconda, we are trying to provide, so Anaconda is uh, open source. All the recipes are open source. The package building system, the package installer called Conda, these are all open source. And we're moving those actually into community governance over the course of you know the next six to 12 months. Um, there's a very robust Conda Forge community where people are able to make their, you know, they work together to make their own recipes. So there's a big community effort around the packages and the distribution and the packaging system. It's very healthy and very vibrant. Um, and as a company, what we try to do is um, get commercial businesses that use these things to contribute, to pay, to contribute sort of financial energy back into the open source ecosystem. And um, I don't know, you know, I think in, in Enthought's case, and I used to work there and, and I can't speak for, you know, their products or their positioning. Um, I think their product is much more designed and oriented towards um, specific, you know, analytical use cases, perhaps. And they do have a distribution, of course, and they do have packaging systems there. Um, I think that the key thing with us is that what, what I like about Anaconda is that we do, you know, we've open sourced all of the bits and uh, we try to work with the community around those pieces and we encourage community innovations on that baseline. Um, but yes, there are several other Python distributions as well. So that's, that's really the case. Um, is there a question in the attendees? Uh, yes. Uh, Hi, um, thank you, from, uh, Mr. Wang, for your great talk. So uh, you talk about the dark pattern, and I have a question regarding uh, for someone who is already working in the company. And <laughs> at the same time, you want to contribute um, to the open source, but at the, on the other hand, you also have to um, keep the privilege of or the uh, resource of the company, right? So how right. do you manage that leverage the uh, open source power, but at the same time, you can still have some contribution to the community. Thank you. 
Thank you. Good, good question. Yes, um, the big uh, cloud vendors and big technology companies, they do employ a lot of people who are very good people who want to do good things for the community. But as you say, uh, they have day jobs, right? You have performance metrics. You have a manager who has goals for you, right? Um, and what I've seen is that in many of these companies, uh, I'll just talk about my, my interactions with Google, Microsoft, and Amazon, for instance, right? Um, I know many people who work at these companies, and inside the companies themselves, uh, I think people can push for projects to uh, collaborate and connect better with open community standards, right? So when you see like an internal project or part of the project that's doing something that maybe overlaps or conflicts with something in the community, something you can push for maybe with your own time or that you can, you know, politically inside the company push for is to reconcile these differences and say, hey, we should try to work with the community and bring these efforts into resonance. Let's try to use the community standard or if it doesn't work, let's give them feedback, you know, and this is something that, that um, again, I think these dark patterns emerge because businesses are very fixated on making money, not because they want to mess with the open source community. Right. Almost no business out there saying we want to go screw up the open source community. What they do is they will just bulldoze over the open source community on their way to making money. Right. So um, all it takes is someone to say internally, oh, you know, this project, um, we are doing this project internally at big company XYZ. And um, we would like I personally am interested in making this work better with your open source project. If you make these changes in the open source project, we can make these things connect better. Right. So examples of things are like uh, Jax and Numba or some of the data structures inside TensorFlow and NumPy and the future of like open tensor stuff that like my co-founder Travis is working on. There's many of these instances where uh, if you're inside a big company and there are open source projects there, um, you can try yourself to push for those to play better with the community projects. And it just takes one or two people being diligent about it to, um, you know, constantly raising the issue on the bug tracker and whatnot to make a big difference. I appreciate your response. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Um, okay. We think our section time is almost end. And mm-hmm. if uh, I think maybe we can have more interaction on the Discord. So attendees and Peter, you can have more talk on the Discord. Yeah. And thank yep. you so much for your sharing. It's really wonderful. And please take care. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity.